to gain tools that will help us be more resilient and to strengthen our potential to thrive. We are here to listen, to learn, and to get inspired. I hope you all have already learned something from others at your table, through your conversations over breakfast, and I hope you all have posted a request on the reciprocity range. If you have not made it yet or gone back to the wall, please do so, like I've already said, and, and also continue to do so at the break. Um, I'd like to take a chance here to recognize the board members of the Community Foundation that are in the room. If you'd stand, please, so we can recognize you. Michelle N. Steve and Esmeralda Tovar Mora are all members of our board. I know we also have members of our committees here in the room. Would you please stand? Mary Grace Clements is a member of our Strategic Impact Committee. Please help me give them a round of applause. We give a lot of their time, attention, and care to the Community Foundation, and we appreciate them. Hopefully you've also met our staff members for the Community Foundation. We are a small but mighty force, um, all women, and I'd like to introduce them if you all would stand. Or if you're already standing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start over here on the left side of the room. Colette Strasner is our Operations Associate. Delmarie Shanahan Sawyer is our Chief Operating Officer. Wendy Skellinger in the back is our communications officer. Um, Amy Crockett is our accounting and operations manager. Carrie Mayhew, director of strategic initiatives. And Sarah Blake is our program officer. We have one other staff member who's not with us today, Courtney Lane, who is um, having a baby in the moment. <laughs> we, we hope. <laughs> she hopes. We, we do a lot of work in this community and it is with a team that is very committed to the work of this community. They love this community and um, it's represented just as much as, just as recently as last night being um, at an event where we hosted professional advisors until nine o'clock last night. And then we're back here at the Cosmos Fair at 7 a.m. to set up for this event. So we're operating on little sleep and lots of um, adrenaline and excitement to do what we do for all of you and for others in this community. Um, we see great... Um, <laughs> very appropriate. We see great value in nonprofit staff and board members learning together and ha having a shared vocabulary about philanthropy. We want to support you in your goals to create sustainable funding so that over time you can focus more and more on impacting the quality of life for everyone in Reno County and less and less on annual fundraising. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we are here as your partner in philanthropy. So today, this is what our program is going to look like. I'm going to speak about the transfer of wealth that's happening in our county and how together we might capture some of that transfer of wealth. Catherine Myrie, our, our keynote speaker, is going to talk about how to become an expert in the conversation of philanthropy. Then we're going to have a partner celebration led by Sarah Blake. We're going to have change maker chats by three of our partners from the Zoo Beyond Barriers and the Reno County Health Department. And then we're going to have some giveaways and a closing by Carrie Mason. If you notice at all, you know we have certain group practices that we ascribe to and ask you to join us in. Um, we'd ask you throughout the whole morning to stay curious, um, to act experimentally with us, to mine the wisdom in the room. We believe the wisdom is right here and to look for ways to find it together. Pay it forward. The reciprocity ring is one way to do that, to find ways to help others and to consider what's possible. Does that make sense to everyone here? Good. I see lots of heads nodding. Let's move forward that way. Uh, did you know that the Community Foundation is nearing the end of its um, 33rd year in business in Reno County? We are. We're very proud of the role 
uh, that we play here and all that we've accomplished in those years. Um, we strive to be, maybe this laugh is out again, don't worry. We strive to be known as trustworthy, innovative, and community-centered. We encourage collaboration, experimentation, and risk. We bring people together around tough challenges, and we make smart grants to address the root causes and build nonprofit capacity to serve more people. But we are always asking ourselves, and our board's always asking us, how can we capture more capital for our community that needs it? How can we capture more capital for our community that needs it? How can we help you capture more capital for your organizations that need it, for the people that you serve that need it? Um, and one of the, so, so today is an example of how we do that, right? To help you become more comfortable talking about philanthropy, talking about fundraising, talking about how to ask for gifts to your organization, for your missions, for the people that you serve. That's one way, one way we do it. What I want to talk about here is one of the most <coughs> promising and urgent ways that we see that we're going to capture capital for our community, and that is understanding and capitalizing on the transfer of wealth that's happening in our community. And I know, I see faces here, people who've heard this spiel from me many times, but I think it bears repeating because it is so important and so urgent and important to know that a, a great amount of wealth is transferring from the oldest generation to the next in Reno County, in every county in Kansas. But according to a WSU study, the projection shows that in Reno County alone, $3.4 billion, written right there, notice the B, the billion, is going to transfer from the oldest generation to the next in this decade alone, $3.4 billion. That's astounding to me to think about that. Um, in the next decade, it's projected to be $4.1 billion. In the next decade, it's $4.7 billion. After that, it starts to taper off. Um, so that shows some urgency there too. What we know is that when money transfers from a parent to a child, from one generation to the next, oftentimes that child or those children or those heirs, if they're, maybe they aren't children, but they're heirs, other loved ones, don't always live in our county any longer. They may live in another Kansas county. They may live in another city. They may live in Dallas or Denver or wherever. Chicago, and as when they, when they, let's say they come home for the, the funeral of their mother, father, and they come home, they, they make all appropriate visits, and as they leave, they meet with the bank, and they, they take that money with them that they've inherited back to their own hometowns, where they put it to use for their own families, and that's the way that that's supposed to go. Heirs are supposed to inherit wealth, but all of that money in that case has left our community. <clears throat> and what that that's devastating to this county that has helped raise that child, helped build the wealth of that family, helped build the business that accumulated the wealth. And um, so for the past decade, what we've set out to do is say, what if we just ask everyone to consider leaving 5% of their final estate, whatever's left at the end of life, you know, whether it's $100 or $100 million, leave 5% of it to this community that you love. Just carve it out, 5%. That 5% is, is not an amount that an heir or two or three heirs would miss, um, but what a huge difference that amount would make here in Reno County and how it would change the face of this community for the people who live here for generations to come. And um, I've been making this ask and in public speeches for over a decade, and I've had people come up to me years later and say, I heard you say that back in 2010, and I've been thinking about it. I can do 5%. 5%, my kids wouldn't miss 5%. And it's really resonated with people. And 5% really kind of takes down people's barriers. I mean, you're not asking me to leave half of it to this community. 5% um, that can do that. How does that work? And I want you to know from the Community Foundation's perspective, 
our mission is to inspire philanthropy. So we just say, well, what do you care about in this community? What, what causes have you given to before? Which organizations do you care about? And then we just try to spark that, that conversation and get people to think about who, what, what they would like to see better because of their, of their philanthropy. And it's just a pretty fun conversation, and I've gotten pretty comfortable with it. You know, it requires the ask, it requires talking about philanthropy, it requires talking about death. <laughs> so, <laughs> it might be a little weird, but I've gotten pretty comfortable talking about it. Um, but I'd like to think that as you think about your missions and what a difference that type of money could make for you, that you too can become comfortable asking people, would you leave a small portion of your estate to our organization? Or would you leave 5% to our community and include our organization in that? Maybe it's not the whole 5%. What we know, what I've experienced is that most people don't choose just one organization. They have at least two things they care a lot about. Um, but if, if we're all talking about the 5% and then we are all going out and asking those, those donors that we have close relationships with, if they have included us in their planning, and it does require a plan, it requires a will or a trust, it requires a beneficiary designation, some sort of tool that says, I want to leave a portion of this to my favorite charity. Um, what, what a difference we could make together if we were all speaking the same language and asking. And, and especially if people start hearing it from multiple directions. We might really start a movement of um, commitments across this community from people who said, yes, I will do that. And here are the organizations I care about most. And I believe they would be all of yours right here. So I wanna, I wanna plant that seed with you, that there's a lot of money out there in Reno County and that it is moving from one hand to the other and this is the time to be making those asks. Are you on board? Mm -hmm. Right, let's do it together. Um, with that, that's, that's just my small part. You're in for a real treat to hear from Catherine Myrie. How many of you have heard Catherine Myrie speak before? Yeah, a lot, and came back for more, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna put my reader back in. Miss Myrie is my friend, and I admire her very much, and I'm so proud to have her back in Hutchinson, um, able to inspire all of us. I'm ready to be inspired again by what she has to share. She is the president of Catherine W. Myrie and Associates, a company she founded 25 years ago. She provides a full range of services to help nonprofits build long-term financial stability through planned gifts and endowments. Ms. Myrie received a BA from Emory University and a JD from the University of Alabama School of Law. She spent 15 years in various positions in the trust division of a large Southeastern bank before jo joining a regional brokerage firm to establish its trust company and serve as its initial president and CEO. Ms. Myrie is a past president of organizations like these, the National Committee on Plan Giving, the Alabama Plan Giving Council, the Estate Planning Council of Birmingham, and the Alabama Bankers Association Trust Division. She is also a current member of the Alabama Bar Association. What I really like about Catherine Myrie is that she has served on a number of community boards for organizations like ours. Notably, she's been a past board chair of the United Way of Central Alabama, a board chair of the Altamont School, the Independent Presbyterian Church Foundation, and I really like this one, past board chair of the Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham. So she has a lot of experience doing what we all do and working in organizations like ours. And we are in for a treat. Catherine Myrie comes in on fire and she's ready to light you up. Ready? <laughs>
and excited to be back with y'all. Hutchinson has really changed. In the years since I was here, I was last year in 2016, and the Wichita Airport has been upgraded and looking good, and Hutchinson really looks good. So kudos to all of you. You're all a part of that. I appreciate so much you submitting your questions. You see a lot of anxiety in the questions. So my job today is to banish the anxiety about talking to donors and give you a very easy way to do that. And the reason this is so important to you is first of all, there's a lot of money out there. Second of all, you probably know, you saw the Giving USA numbers, that last year, Americans gave $485 billion to charity. That's a lot of money. It was up 12% from the year before, even with COVID, even with inflation. That's significant. And here's the important thing. 78% of that $485 billion came from individuals, not corporations, not foundations, but individuals. I'll give you a little insight into my, how I formed these perspectives that I'm going to share with you. First of all, I've learned more from donors than anybody else. I went to law school, so I wear a lot of hats. I went to law school under the state planner, so I operate in that very safe environment. I understand the mechanics. I am a donor. I've got gifts under my will. I make gifts during my life. I'm very involved in the community. It's part of who I am. I am a board member and have been a board member and fundraising chair and all these other things on board. So that's a little bit different lens, isn't it? Because in that role, my job is to ensure that there are adequate resources for whatever charity I am representing. And then finally, I'm a consultant. I've been doing that for 25 years. My clients are nonprofits. But when I get, when they get stuck with a gift, they've got a lot of them, somebody wants to make a big gift, and maybe they have weird assets or they want to do something different or they want to do one of these double backflip kind of gifts, you know, very complex. I get to come to the table. That is my favorite part because donors are who drive me. I have learned more about donors through those experiences than you can ever imagine, and I want you to have that same experience. When I first got into this field, I thought fundraising was about blocking and tackling, right? <laughs> we're gonna go find somebody and we're gonna pin them on the ground until they make a gift, and that's my job to get them to do that. And that's what I thought, that I was trying to get people to do something they didn't want to do. That isn't my job at all. What I've learned is that donors want to create impact. All you need to do is hear their story and hear the why. And that's the biggest thing I want you to take out of this room. You are not trying to get people to do something they don't want to do. You are facilitating their charitable vision for your organization. That is a completely different lens. And because I have had so, I had a week, must have been about four or five years ago now, and it was one of those light bulb moments. So on a Tuesday, I was talking to a donor of a little charity I do work for up in Washington. 
called Food and Friends, and they deliver nutritional food to people that are seriously ill. They started out serving the HIV AIDS community, and now that the meds are so good, they have expanded and it's other life-threatening illnesses. And it's generally people that don't have family. And so it's both food and just a human touch. And there was a volunteer that worked for him for about 20 years, and he wanted to make a $1,000 gift through his estate, and he did not want to talk to an attorney. I get it. I get it. I get it. And we talked for an hour. The first 45 minutes of that conversation, I wanted to know all about him. Why was he there? Why was he such a great volunteer? What did he hope to achieve with that gift? Tell me more about that. And only in the last few minutes of the conversation did we talk about how to do that. And for him, the easiest way was to name the charity as beneficiary of this IRA for $1,000, no attorney, done. Three days later, I was in Atlanta with another charity. And I was at the table for a different reason. And I was at the table because this gift was large. It was the organization's first endowment. They had never done an endowment. And the assets were very complex. This man had a bunch of LLCs, LOPs, C-Corps, S-Corps. If, if it's in the state code and it has a letter, he had some of that. And it was all different percentages of ownership. And the underlying asset was real estate. And so it was a complex gift. It was for $100 million. So this is a fun conversation, right? You know what I did? I started out talking about him. Why was that organization important to him? How did he get involved in that organization? Tell me more about what lights him up most about what this organization does. And we went on. Then I wanted to know what he hoped to accomplish with the gift how we were gonna measure success. And the only difference is this conversation was more like four meetings, but we did not talk about the how until the very end. At the very end, we talked about timing of the gift, the assets we were gonna use for the gift, and how the type of gift we were gonna to put together. You get the picture? We can all do that. Every one of you in this room can sit down with a donor. And if you're genuinely interested, and I know you all are, then start by talking to them about why they're there. There are more than 1.5 million charities in this country. If they picked you, there's a reason. There's a reason for that. And you just need to get that story. So I want y'all to be story getters. And you will find that if you are good story getters, I'm sure that grammar isn't quite right, but y'all don't want to on this. If you're good at that, then you're gonna build a strong relationship. These conversations build trust, they help you understand what's most important to them, that they allow you to align what you're doing with what's most important to them. They are magic. They are magic. And you probably would be surprised to know this, but I am a rank introvert. Okay? And I was raised in Montgomery, Alabama. And I tell you that because Montgomery, Alabama, we have rule books 
about social graces. And my mother was the Zen master at the book. And one of the things she taught me, two things. One, you never talk about money. That was life. Forget that. Number two, she told me that you've got to be comfortable if you're going to make whoever you're talking to comfortable. And that is absolutely true. So I want the point of today, I want you to get comfortable. I want you to find your own voice. I want you to all be Zen masters at this conversation. And you can be. All right, so here's the deal. Here are my rules. I would like you to stop me as we're going along. If you have a general question and you're looking around the room thinking everybody in this room wants to know the answer to this question, I want you to stop me and let's answer it in context. If you have a very detailed fact situation, then I'm happy to talk to you at the break or afterwards. I'll be here and I'd love to answer that question. I do want to ask you, as you're listening today, to think about the donors. All of you, think about the five donors that you really wish you could sit down with because you know they are passionate about what you do and you want to talk to them. You just don't know how. Think about those, and as you're thinking about them, if when I'm talking you have questions about that, and things I haven't said, then I want you to stop me and ask me. Is that okay? And here's the other deal. This is so important. I'm going to stop at 9.45 and we're going to take a 15-minute break before we listen again. Because y'all have been captured here for a little <laughs> while already. There we go. So the reason I think this is so powerful is because these conversations allow you to really understand your donor. Do not make the mistake of thinking every donor supports you for a specific reason. I'll tell you one more story. Do you don't mind if I tell you one more <laughs> And so one of the things um, in a volunteer capacity I was doing is working with the dean of my law school. If you had to look at groups of donors for a level of difficulty in talking to them, I put doctors at the top, the hardest because they are creative people. They want something special, different, just a bit. Well, lawyers are right behind them. So <laughs> my dean wanted to know how to talk to lawyers about estate gifts and things like that. So I was training him on this conversation. I had it, we would make coffee, da da da. And I, it was about my fourth meeting. Every time I'm out with the dean, he would bring this proposal and throw it in front of me to ask me, to fund a scholarship at the law school. He was very ambitious, wanted a lot of money. I was amazed he thought I could do that. But every time I would push it back, I was still trying to teach him how to have this conversation. Finally, on about the fourth try, I looked at him and I said, Dean, what do you think I give to the law school? And he looked at me and cocked his head. He said, well, you do it because we're great. We're going up in the national state law school rankings every year. We've got this great faculty. We're doing this and that. And I wouldn't let him finish. And then I said, no. And he looked at me and long pause. And finally said, why do you support us? I thought, we are getting somewhere. <laughs> And I said, I support you because when I was a student there, your faculty was invested in my success. Their door was always open. They were my greatest champion. There was no stupid question I could ask. And I'm talking to students who are there now. And they tell me you still have that same culture. That's what's important to me. That's what makes you a great law school. And he got a furrowed brow. I said, so Dean, scholarships are your priority. They are not mine. 
if you won't really invest in the law school, you need to give me something related to faculty. You see what I mean? We make the assumption that we know why donors support us. We do not. We do not. You need to ask. Everybody has a story. But these conversations build relationships. And during COVID, my charities that did a good job with the relationships found that these donors were more committed. They doubled down on their giving because the need for greater. That's your value. That's the value to you in this. Here's what we're going to cover. I want to talk about the challenges you face every day. The donor's challenges. Not just about us, remember. This is donor-centric. All about the donor. If it's all about you, you're not going to meet with a very receptive audience. You go in with your, I want this list, to explain to them what you want, what you need, it's going to be a short conversation. You go in to find out what they want to achieve, there you go, that's your conversation. We're going to talk about the critical, the principles, the critical role of your mission, the unique role of your mission, how you identify the best prospects. Not everybody's ready for this conversation. How to talk to donors about significant gifts. How to expand the current conversation on giving to include the state gifts. How you hear opportunities and then how you follow through. All right? Pretty ambitious agenda. Buckle your seatbelt. So let's talk first about your challenges. How many donors do you have? Thousands, thousands, thousands. Right? Well, you wish so. You're newer and smaller, but still, there are a lot of donors. They are not all the same. So how do you know when to begin this conversation? How do you listen? Those are your challenges. You just don't know. If you've not done it a lot, you worry. I think the number one worry that I had was that, and this is so, lawyer of me. I was worried my donors were going to ask me a question I couldn't answer and that I would be embarrassed. Well, forget that. You know what I mastered saying? You know, I want to make sure I give you the right answer. Let me go check on that and I'll come back and answer that question. Well, that's a double win. Number one, I got another meeting with the donor. This is good. Number two, I don't have to blurt out where I'm going with this. And in number three, honestly, I do better if I can go back and think through it and come up with some ideas. So don't feel compelled. Don't worry about that. That is a non-starter. You can always say, you know, I'm going to make sure I give you the right answer. Or how about this? I'm not sure. I mean, it's not like lightning bolts come down if you say, I'm not sure. I think people appreciate the honesty. But you need to understand, especially right now, donors have a lot of pressures on them, pressure on them. They are worried about inflation. We all are. They are worried about health care, what's going to happen to our health care system. They are worried about retirement. And they are going back to work some of them. If they are on fixed income, they're worried about it. So what does that mean? It means that it limits what they can do because if they're nervous and they're anxious, they're going to make sure their number one priority is to make sure they maintain their own lifestyle. They're not going to make a gift to you that would compromise their ability to live, right? You have to be cognizant of that. It doesn't mean they're not giving. What did I just tell you about giving the USA number? They're giving all right. But I'm just saying, I am always listening. Maybe they're taking care of a child. Maybe they've got a health care issue. I don't know. I'm listening for all of that. Because whatever I talk to them about has got to fit them. It's got to fit them. 
And just so you're clear, I am not talking about the $100 million gifts. I am talking about all gifts. All gifts. In my world, after all the conversations I've had with donors, if they're breathing, they're a prospect. <laughs> and I have been so surprised by donors. That's what lights me up. You will be too. I had early in my consulting career, one of my universities dispatched me to go meet with a donor in Mississippi. I think they thought, I don't know, that this guy wasn't worth a lot. Um, I don't know what they thought, but they were too busy. They, and they thought it was going to be complex, um, maybe. And so they sent me over there. Well, I don't know if y'all have ever been in Mississippi, but Mississippi, um, it, my directions, this was before GPS, my directions read something like, go down the old highway, Jackson Highway, and you get off at the red mailbox with the dent in the side. Of it. And then you go down that road, and then when you get to the tree that's split into three pieces, you take a left, and you keep going, and it was those kind of directions. So I'm, I'm following the directions, and I get, I'm going through all these trees, just trees everywhere. And I get to this very modest house, and I'm, I mean very modest house, and we go inside, I'm sitting at the kitchen table, we're having dark pepper and a piece of pie to have this discussion. And as I began to talk to these, this couple, one, they had a huge heart for this university. They both had been there, they were passionate. Second, all the trees they had been driving through, those were their trees. And any of you who traffic in trees, they have a lot of value, just depending on whether homes are being built. And they wanted to make a $2 million gift mm -hmm. with their trees. I was all about it. But the thing is, if you had met them in their overalls, and it, definitely not Sunday clothes, I mean, if you had met them, you would have overlooked them. And I want you to treat every donor like they have the power to change the world, because they do. They do. They absolutely do. So in my world, I work in something called gift planning. And it's, when I started, it was called plan giving. Those are estate gifts. Gift planning is a broader concept. Gift planning means meeting the donor where they are. It's not siloed in a today gift or tomorrow gift. I talk to donors like an impact gift. So we may create a gift that is partially funded now, partially funded through the estate. We have all kind of ways we can do that. One big goal. The key is still understanding what they want to achieve. But gift planning is really funding the donor's dream and their vision. It's really understanding first. There are four steps. One, understanding what the donor wants to do. And as I've told you from my examples, that's where I spend my time. Then once we know what the donor wants to do, we're going to talk about the asset we're going to use. We're going to talk about the form of the gift. Is it going to be a request? Is it going to be an IRA beneficiary designation? Is it going to be a trust that pays them income? Is it going to be an outright gift and a combination of those? And then we're going to talk about the timing. My $100 million gift. The man was still active in his business. He was going to use those LCs, OPs, C Corps, S Corps to fund this gift. We created the gift through his estate. It was in his will. But I knew he was going to be retiring in five years. So the last thing we talked about, I said, when you retire, and begin to sell these interests, come to me. Come to us. And we can put your gift to work today 
and you will be able to see the impact of this incredible gift and the transformation it's going to achieve. Isn't that cool? But do you see that conversation? It wasn't just parked in the estate. It was his goal, and we wanted to get it funded. And you need to think about it like that more broadly. Don't think it's just one and done. And what we're trying to do in this planning process is fit the donor, the assets, the timing, the gift form, his goals, and make it fit. And we have all these tools to do it. And the Community Foundation is very conversant and all the tools, you can use them as a resource. Simple examples of what I mean by gift planning. If you are age 70 and a half or older, no brainer here, you need to use your IRA to do your gift. Everybody, everybody, you know why? Because you're allowed under the law to make $100,000, up to 100,000, you can send up to 100,000 of your IRA directly to a public charity. You are using your most highly taxed assets. None of those assets have had income tax paid on. So you, whether you itemize or not, you're going to get the benefit of making that gift to charity. You realize after they doubled the um, standard deduction and indexed it, that only 10% of all taxpayers itemize. Did you realize that? You know what percentage of this country gives to charity every year? 65%. Most people who are giving do not give, do not get a charitable deduction. Yes? Can you ask the question so that you can answer for the room you hear? Yes. As you say that they should be doing all of their giving, <coughs> you mean not 100,000, you mean every kind of charitable should be given through their IRA, am I correct? Church? That is correct. To the Girl Scouts, all of the little gifts they do should be coming out of their purse. That is correct. I don't have a lot of donors that give 100000 but I'm saying every gift. All you do is call the plan administrator. They have a form. Don't pay off. And you fill out the form. It does not come to the donor, and then you give it to the charity. It goes directly to the charity. But I don't care whether it's $1,000 or $5,000. It's the most tax efficient and effective way to make it. And think about this. The Federal Reserve does a survey of assets that people own. People only hold 2.4% of their assets in cash and money market funds. You know where the money is? The number one asset, 24% of their assets, retirement plans and IRA. 24%. 22% real estate. 20% publicly traded stocks and bonds. 11% privately owned businesses. So if you're just talking to them about the cash, not having a very big conversation. But this allows them not to use that cash. They're using their IRA. Other thing that I think is a simple example. If you're gonna make a gift to charity, use long-term appreciated stock. Even if you don't itemize, you avoid the, chair, the capital gains on that. If you do itemize, you get the charitable deduction, and you avoid the capital gains. It's just working smart. It, it increases the capacity of your donor. So, gift planning is powerful because you have so many ways to make a gift. You can make an outright gift. There are a lot of gifts that pay income, charitable gift annuities, charitable major trust, and then there are deferred gifts. And then I've got the last combination, column, any combination. So what does that do? It expands the donor capacity. Use the foundation if you see an opportunity. I also, I just want to explain what a blended gift was. I've mentioned this. It's a combination of today and tomorrow. Let me give you the 
best example. It is a virtual endowment. Has anybody ever heard of a virtual endowment? I love this tool. So I come to you and I say, I'll, I'll benefit the Boys and Girls Club. I'll come in and I'll say, I've left a million dollars in my will for the Boys and Girls Club. And you say, thank you very much. And um, glad to do it. And then you say to me, you know, Catherine, that is going to change so many lives. You cannot imagine the impact that is going to have. The only thing I regret is that you cannot see it go to work today. If I could show you a way to put that to work today, would you be interested? And I'll say, well, I sure would, but don't get any ideas about me giving you a million dollars today. I can't afford to do that. Not to worry. Here's what you do. If you will give us every year the amount that endowment would generate, let's say if you have a 4.5% endowment rate, give us 45,000 every year and we will put that to work. Then, when the gift is funded through your estate, it will continue to make that payout. See what I mean? It's a way for them to afford that impact today. My donors that I talk to love this. I do it a lot with scholarships, you can imagine. And so you can meet the scholarship recipient. You can go ahead and watch it. And boy, once I see it go to work, they are all in. And it impacts what they will do for you annually as well. I want you to know that your mission is unique. The Community Foundation mission is unique. Every one of your charities has a unique mission. Here's why I say that. I already told you there are 1.5 million charities. What you do is what's important to the donor. And I want you to understand that you're not competing with anybody else. Honestly, people give where they're connected. The school, Altamont School, my boys went to school there. I live in the city of Birmingham. Unfortunately, our school system is wretched. Wretched. And so all the kids in my neighborhood went to private school. We had to. And I would be over there all the time. I chaired the board. So my boys were doubly humiliated. One, they had a mother. <laughs> How embarrassing is this? <laughs> Their mother. And two, I was over there all the time. So they couldn't pretend like I didn't exist. But my point is, that's where I was connected, right? And it was important to me, my boys were there. Where did I give? I gave there. I was very involved in my church. I gave there. I was on the United Way board. I gave there. You see the pattern? What's important to me drives my giving. And all of your donors probably give to anywhere from five to eight organizations that are important to them. And they have picked those because they're important to them. So you're not competing. You're really just engaging donors who have raised their hand and said, what you do is important to me. I think that's important to remember. But you need to talk about missions and outcomes. All the surveys. Yes. Is, this is maybe backing up a little bit, but the question that I'm thinking about, and I know a few others in the room, uh, are in a little bit of the same, the same boat as far as having a, a small organization. Yes. And being so mission focused for years and just looking at impact and what you're getting done, how do you back up from that and start to engage these conversations even within your own organization to so many better things? Good question. So how do you get to the table to begin with? Number one, everybody starts transactionally. Special events, annual funding. And what I want you to encourage you to do and tell you is so important. I mean, you've got to raise money if you're going to operate. 
You can't live on periodic grants. You need donors. Seventy-eight percent of the money is coming from donors, right? As you do your annual fund, as you do your special events, you need to track it. When we get to who are your best prospects, I'm going to tell you, look for points of engagement. That is multi-year giving. That is people who come to events. That is people who are hands-on volunteers. Those are people that are on your board. Those are people that use your services. Those are people whose family uses your services. Why am I telling you this? Because when you're lean and mean, you're not tracking it in your data system. It is gold. It is the only way you're going to see these donors. And so I would tell you, track the data. And when we talk about who the people are you need to be talking to, you're going to use that data like a divining rod. But if you're not tracking the data, you are operating blind and you will not see these passionate people. Did that answer? Very good, thank you. So, just understand your mission drives giving. You need to be articulate, articulate about it. You need to talk about outcomes. The Lilly School of Philanthropy does some great research on giving and what they will tell you, the number one reason people give they give for impact. They give for outcomes. So what you need to do in your marketing, in your conversation, in your stewardship, you need to position donors as partners in mission. They are partners in mission. You cannot do what you do without them. So I don't want to see an annual report that says, we served this many meals or filled this many beds or did this or that or the other. I want you to say it. I want you to say, here's what we did together. Without you, this would not have been possible. It is just a slight change, but I want you to read every piece of marketing material you have to see if you position donors as partners in mission. It is so critical. Does that make sense? And we forget about that. But I look at them as investors in mission, partners in mission, and I use those words when I'm talking to them. And I want to tell them every time I see them, I cannot thank you enough, Catherine, for what you have done for this community. Your gifts have changed lives. Your gifts have changed lives. You need to have a clear vision of where you're going. If you don't have a strategy and a plan, if you don't know where you're going, if you don't know what that vision is, then you're going to lose your donor. A lot of these gifts, the untapped resource, a state gift. The Lilly School of Philanthropy found that one-third of donors, if asked, would consider an estate gift. It is the ask that is so critical. That is all ages. That is all income levels from under $25,000 a year to over $100,000 a year. And they all said a third would consider a gift. It is your biggest opportunity. So, but they're not going to invest in your future if you have no idea what that looks like. Let's talk about the principles. And you've heard me already. I, I feel like I'm on my soapbox, but y'all bear with me. If this is new to you, then it bears repeating. But these are the principles that I use when I talk to donors. One, I want you to change your lens. It's not about you, and by that I mean your organization. It's not about your want list. It's about the donor. I want you to be donor-centric. And the interesting thing is, you know, I get a lot of calls, 
and fundraising, so I've got one I've got to answer right now. Emory's looking for me. They want to come chat with me. I am the master at deflecting a call. If you call me up and say, Captain, I'd like to come talk to you. Um, I'm bringing my boy chair with me. I will say, gosh, I'm so sorry I'm going to miss you. You know, I'm traveling. And they'll say, well, when you will you be back? Oh, not for a long time. Years. Years. <laughs> but if you call me and say, Comfort, you have had such an impact on our organization. Your gifts have made the difference. I want to come share with you some of the things that have happened as the result of your gift. I, I'm so excited. I cannot wait to share this with you. And also, you know us so well. You volunteer. You've been on our board. You're one of our longest-term donors. We are really looking ahead, and I need your input. Would you be willing to share your thoughts? I want to tell you what we're thinking about. And I hope you'll agree to maybe even a leadership role. May I come speak to you? Okay, what have I done? What is the difference in those two calls? Because I'll take that second call every time. I was very specific. I, I was very specific. It was a stewardship call, wasn't it? Because I'm thanking them. I'm reminding them of their engagement, of their impact, and I want their advice. Now, I'm not stupid. I know they want me to donate as well. But I'm, they just put me in a very different spot. This very vague, may I come see you, they know what you want. There's no reason for me to do that. I don't want to be embarrassed by telling you no. I, I, it's a different conversation. So small, subtle things. And that works because you're focused on them. Not on you. We're focused on them. The most important thing to realize is an objection when they say no or push back, I don't have the money right now. I love it. It opens the door. It opens the door for me to ask questions. We'll get to the conversation after the break. It's about you asking questions to get the story. I always want the story. And it's so important if you know why I'm giving. Our children's hospital in Alabama saved my son's life at age 17. My husband and I were in New York. We were celebrating our 20th anniversary. And Harry had been delivering food for a school project to older folks who were shut in. He's highly allergic. And pet dander or something, and he began to be garbled in his speech. He was lethargic. They didn't know what was going on. My housekeeper took him to the hospital. They couldn't figure it out. By the time we got out of the show, I had eight calls. My husband and I had eight calls on our phone. We called and they said, it's not going the right way. We don't know what's wrong. And they had a lot of questions. They figured it out, and by the time we got back the next morning, he was sitting up, he was in intensive care, but he was sitting up in a taking world. I will always be grateful. They're in my state. That's a story you need to know, right? Maybe not every story is that dramatic, but they support you for a reason. And now that you know why I, they know why I support that hospital, now, what kind of conversations can we have? We can have if they have emergency care, if they have allergic specialties, whatever it is. That's the power. And if the prospect is a strong one, they're going to tell you the path that's most important. It's like me telling the dean, quit giving me that scholarship proposal. I'm all about your faculty. Let's see. I can get started on this. I'm going to get started on prospects. And then I want you to think about your own prospects 
And when we come back, I want some questions. I'm very grateful for some of the questions I've got. But this side of the room, y'all have work to do on the questions. <laughs> You're being a little shy. This is not going to be make you successful. You need to be bold and ask. So I look for the triple A's. That's easy to remember. Affinity, association, and ability. Here's what that means. Affinity. I'm looking for long-term donors at any given level. Give me a 15-year donor giving you $200 a year, and I can really work with that. There is definitely a story there. And many of your lower end donors, modest donors, they're not giving more, number one, because you've never been face to face and asked them to. And number two, they will make their first major gift through their will. Right? If they're breathing, they're a prospect. So I'm looking for anything that tells me, like giving, that they are passionate about what we do. Number two, association. How are they connected to you? Are they on your board? Do they use your services? Does their family use your services? Do they come to events? Do they volunteer after school? Do they volunteer on weekends, I call it points of engagement. For my hospitals, I do a lot of work with hospitals. It's going to be grateful patient. I do a lot of work with universities and higher ed, and it's going to be alums or sports fanatics. I do come from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Nick Saban just signed? a $93.6 million contract. The man is 70 years old. <laughs> this is good work. <laughs> you know? Association. And then ability. I draw that bar very low. Really. And I would say I treat everybody pretty much like a prospect. Because I'm not looking for wealth, I'm looking for commitment. And there are certainly people that cannot afford to make a significant gift, I meet them all the time. But through their estate, even if they could only leave 5,000, 10,000, we would take that every day. So I treat them like they have, as I've said before, the power to change the world. One of the most powerful donors I ever heard was a woman named Osceola McCarty. Does anybody know that name? Yes? Osceola lived in Mississippi. She never got past the sixth grade because she had to drop out and support her family. She washed clothes for a living. And she understood what I tried desperately to treat my, teach my children, which is, it's not how much you make, it's how much you save. She left $150,000 to the University of Southern Mississippi for scholarships for women so they would have access to education. I heard her speak. You have never seen a broader smile than OCO's. It was, she inspired millions of dollars worth of gifts. She changed my life on giving. She taught me that everybody can change the world. I want you to celebrate your donors. Don't just celebrate your newsletters, the ones that make the big gifts. I want you to celebrate the hearts I want you to tell the story so that everybody in the community sees themselves in one of these stories. I also, if I'm going to have <laughs> conversations about a state gift, I start at age 45. Here's why. 
people create their first will in their 40s, mid 40s. Why do they do it? To name guardians to their children, generally. Or in my case, I want to be real clear about who was not going to be the guardian. <laughs> if they have no children, that raises potential for these gifts. If they are single or widowed, it raises potential for these estate gifts. And female. I think part of that is, you know, women. We're sturdier. We tend to live a little bit longer. Um, and so they're the second to die in the couple. And if I look at estate tax returns, I see more requests from women. But it really is about points of contact. Any questions before we go to break about that? But, and I'm just gonna conclude that part by saying, oh, a question, well, thank you, this side of the room. <laughs> question. When you were going back to your, your gift, And we just went through COVID. Yes. And so some have grown, but some have dropped off. And then there's also organizations that have had to change the hands. Yes. In their management. And so there were these donors that came for a long time and then all of a sudden they're gone. How do you approach the donor that you've missed for the last year? Okay, that's a great question. How do you approach a donor? that you've lost touch with, or that has lost connection with your organization. Number one, I'm going back to your database. Every dot in there is important to you. You need to know. If I'm hearing things like that, I'll tell you what a lot of my clients did during COVID. They simply picked up the phone and called people and said, I'm just calling to check. How are you doing? How are you coming through this? We're doing great over here. Just wanted you to know, we understand the world has changed, but we're just calling to check in. And they might say, gosh, we ourselves have seen more need and go from there. Just to let them know, you're not soliciting them. It is a stewardship call. It is a connection call. I use my board for that. I use my staff for that. I put, you know, support staff on that before. Everybody's calling just to reach out and say, hello, how are you? I think if you call and reach out and say, Captain, I know we had not connected in a while. I would love to get you over here to see what we're doing, or to meet the new director, or whatever it is. I, I, my point is this, you would be surprised how many charities have called you just to say, Catherine, thank you, or whatever your name is. <laughs> um, but I have found so few charities call to say thank you for your gift mid-year, and just say, you cannot imagine the impact your gift is having. I don't care if it's $25. Or they call to say, Kevin, you just made, you just hit your 10th year of giving. You are one of our most critical supporters. I just want to thank you. That's all you say. You're not soliciting. Meaning that if you don't drive the connection, you will lose it. If you make time to just reach out, if I call five donors, I get three answer machines, maybe four, and all I do is leave a message. This is Kevin Murray, I'm calling on behalf of the Community Foundation or United Way or Altamont School, and I just want to say thank you. Your gift has been so critical, especially during COVID. And if you have any questions about what we're doing, I would love to share. So many exciting things are going on right now. Oh, we've got new leadership. It's so exciting. So it's simple. It doesn't cost you any money. 
you can make time if you just carve out 30 minutes a day to make those calls. And that's what I would recommend. Because that is, it takes so much to get a donor in the door. And donors who have been in the door give more than brand new donors. So watch your retention rate. Frenzy and say thank you to those donors that are loyal. And when you lose one, don't wait too long to call and leave that message. So that would be my answer. Does that help? See a little skepticism. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's take a 15 minute break. I use a few or few seconds. Let's come back at 10 and we'll have one more hour. I did find a slide, I didn't even know I had it in here. I wanted y'all to meet Ocella, that remarkable woman, and also Sylvia Bloom. I want to tell you a little about Sylvia. Sylvia worked for her entire career as an assistant to a lawyer in a big law firm back in the days where you were the secretary that we don't call they're not secretaries anymore but she went through that whole evolution and supported her attorney and one of the things he would have her do is to call his broker and place investments like, I need to buy a thousand shares of Coke or whatever. And every time she placed an order on his behalf, she bought some of the same stock for herself. <laughs> At her death, which is modest, I mean, she did not make a large salary. She was a lovely woman. At her death, she left six and a half million dollars to charity. Six and a half million. Most of it for a homeless shelter. But my point in sharing these two amazing ladies with you is every donor has potential. And you can't tell, I guarantee. I spent 15 years in the bank in the trust department, and a lot of my clients were up there because they didn't want anybody to know anything about their wealth. And they were very modest people. They drove 15-year-old cars, and I managed 10 or $20 million for them. You could not tell. Um, so you've got that thing going on, and then you've got the potential of people who you would never suspect had the ability to make a significant gift, and they do. So just keep those ladies in mind. Now, I've kind of already popped this balloon because I've been talking about the conversation all along, but I want to do this. I'm going to go over this conversation. I call it my magic conversation. And then, don't panic, I'm going to ask y'all to turn to the person to your right or just pair up at your table, and I want you to interview them using these questions. All right, I'll tell you how that's going to work. Just be prepared. I just want you to put it into use. Some of your tables have odd numbers. So if your staff do not participate, if your staff of the foundation, if that makes, will eliminate the odd. And if there is an odd, just listen. So before you call, I want you to know why you're calling the donor. So you've got to do your research. And think about why you're picking up that phone to make the call. It's a stewardship. Are you trying to get a meeting because you want to talk to them about a major gift or any gift at all? Are you in campaign? Are you trying to get an estate gift? Um, I want you to know why you're calling them. I operate in a world that I, I, I have just by nature a strategic focus. I want to start at the top 
What am I trying to achieve? How am I going to measure success? Only then can I decide what the course of the conversation is. So I want to encourage you to use that lens. Either you're calling a donor because they've lapsed, or you're calling a donor because they put five years of giving and you want stewardship, or you're calling a donor because you think they're going to be key to an upcoming campaign and you want them to serve as a volunteer or a big donor. Know why you're calling. Then two, don't ever make a call that you don't open with thank you. You do not say it too often. Catherine, I want to thank you. You have had such an impact on our work. You are one of our best donors. Yes, question. If every call opens with thank you, can you just explain then what stewardship means, what the difference is? Okay, stewardship has two points, two elements. The first element of stewardship is running a good ship. In other words, if I give you a donation, I expect to get a response about that. I'm going to want to see a substantiation letter. I'm going to want to see an acknowledgement. I'm going to want to make sure if I come in and say I'd like to give you a gift of real estate that you know what to do with that and that you can manage that gift. That's one part of it. But the bigger part to me is saying thank you to the donor and helping them see the impact of their gifts. Help them see that your gifts change lives. And going back, you've got 1.5 million options for donors. If you don't respond and say thank you, you know what they're going to think? I guess they didn't need the money. I'm, I'm just a widget. I'm just an ATM. Donors feel like ATMs. <coughs> If you just ding them all the time with direct mail and done them, did you, I don't care whether it's digital or print, they feel like an ATM. It is not a good feeling. I want you to make them feel like a partner. And stewardship to me is making them feel like a partner in your mission and saying thank you and reminding them that their gifts change lives. Yes. Could you spend another minute or two talking about me, uh, talking with us about the nuances of saying thanks without turning into Charlie Brown's teacher? So every time the phone, oh, thank you, thank you, oh, thank you, thank you. How does it, how does it become authentic when you've said it 10 times? You're just going to find a different cadence and voice. Um, and John, this Catherine, um, how are you? And But I always start by picking out something I know about the donor and saying it was sure good to see you last week at our gala. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you being there. Or maybe it's going to be, you know, I just noticed you get your 12th year of giving. <coughs> that is just incredible. So I'm uh, donor-centric. Before I call, I'm going to know as much as I can about the donor. I plan every call, but generally, it's not hard. I might call and say, John, oh, I missed you. It's been a year since you were on our board. I need you back. I want to get you involved. You made such a difference. Thank you. See what I mean? If, if you, your person, their person. What I'm trying to do is to remind them that they are, they're engaged with us and they are having an impact on us. But I start every conversation with a thank you along those lines. Did that help? You also just said the word needed. And people, it feels good to be needed. Right. It does feel good to be needed. And I think, I had one organization I've been giving to for over 30 years. No one ever acknowledged me. I don't see staff. Nobody knew it, apparently. And I thought, am I really important? 
to this organization. I'd rather invest my money where I can see and see some excitement. It's not for my ego. It's just I have choices. I want to give where I can light something up. And you've got to let me know I'm lighting it up because I'm over there in my house. I don't see what you do every day. So find a way to make it personal. It might be on the last donor. Oh, we missed you. Oh, there must be a story. I've got to come see you. It just whatever it is, be personal to the donor. Be genuine. Don't be fake. They hear it. I'm, I'm talking genuine. So everyone's different. I always ask for help, which is easier than asking for money. If I want to set up that call, I really do want their opinion. If I'm getting ready to build an endowment, I want to get their perspective. I've got this idea about how I'm going to structure endowment to make it more exciting to our donors and related to what we do. I want to go run it by this person, honestly. And use your donors for that. Yeah. <coughs> your thoughts on the initial contact of phone calls versus uh, um, social media or written letters, you know, I was, I'm sure there's personal, personal contacts and texts, but, but uh, just your thoughts on all those. Okay, things. the question is, what works best? A phone call, an email, a text? What works best? And here's the tough answer, it depends. Depends on your donor. And so I'm always key to preferences. If I call a couple of times and never get them, um, even if I call and leave a message, I may say, if you prefer text or email, please let me know. I want to make it easy for you. And I ask donors all the time what they prefer. Um, I ask everybody that. My son, for example, wants email, not text. My husband, I know I'll do better if I just call it. <laughs> it's, it's, everybody's different, and that goes back to your database. If you ask, you need to write it down, because who can remember all that? It goes to your database. If your database, I want you to give a little more respect. It is the most important tool you have. It is the most important tool. Here are some conversational principles. I'm big on the principles. Number one, donor centric means donor centric. I've got clients that just can't get that straight. Their priority is the new cancer center. And boy, they are going in to get that donor to get them a new cancer center. Well, you likely is not going to be disappointed if that's not important to them. And so now you've got a no slammed door in your face. Donor centric. Take the time to listen to the donor. Number two, this is a relationship building conversation. There is no downside to this conversation. None. I want you to practice it on um, every opportunity you have. No downside. The worst that happens is you build a stronger relationship and learn something about it. It is not a treasure hunt. You're not calling to say, may I see your balance sheet? <laughs> this woman told us that you only have two and a half percent of your assets in cash. Let's see what you got. It's not a treasure hunt. My mother's principle is number three. If you are comfortable, they will be comfortable. If you are anxious, nervous, you're going to telegraph that. It's going to dampen the conversation. And finally, you're going to know you're in the right place when you see them sit back, relax, and smile, and begin to talk to you. You're going to know you're doing it. You're right on track. Don't get in a hurry would be another one. You're not going in there. I know you're what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I've got a busy day. I need to get this done. One and done. Let's, let's do it. Let me run through these questions. Uh, you've got to pace it.
based on where they are. And if I see I'm making progress, but I'm not there yet to the ask, I'm going to find a reason before I leave to come back. Bring them some more information, bring them over to the place, whatever. Don't get in a hurry. Here's how my magic questions. Here are, they are. One, thank you. You just heard me explain what that looks like. By the way, these are my words. This way I do it. You need to find your own voice. Follow this pattern, but use the words that fit and are comfortable to you. Number two, you've been a great partner with the foundation or our charity. We could not do what we do without you. I think that's an important thought to leave behind. We can't do what we do without you. You are an essential, an essential partner. And here come the questions. When did you first make a gift to our charity? Tell me how that happened. Tell me more about that. What prompted that gift? And I want to hear the story. Why? That's the why. And then, and these get, these are really designed for community foundations, but let me just talk to you for your charity. I'll go back to the Boys and Girls Clubs because that's stuck in my head. When did you make your first gift to Boys and Girls Clubs? Tell me about that. Oh, your neighbor introduced you. Oh, you came to one of our events. Did you know what we did before then? What surprised you most? Then I'll move to the next question. Gosh, you have been a donor to us for eight years. And first of all, that is remarkable. You are so critical to our work. But tell me what it is we do that keeps you coming back. What part of our work is most important to you. Think about my dean at the law school. That's the question. I want to know. And you're going to get that answer. And in the course of this, you may hear the story of what brought them there. Whether it's my story I shared about the hospital, whether if you're the organization that focuses on child abuse, you had a friend as a child who was abused, and that's why this work is so important to you. I want to know the story. And if I make it safe to talk, if I just follow up their answers, they may send me over here a little bit, over here, any door that opens, I'm going to smile and ask a question about it. I want to let them talk. I want to get what's going on with them. So now I know what's most important to them and why they're supporting me every year. Yes, question. So when do you recognize that you're not the only thing to ask that someone else is that's closer to them and has more connection? The question is, when do you realize you're not the one to make the ask? And here's the beauty of this conversation. I haven't gotten to ask. You're learning. I, if I am talking to this donor and I learn that the reason they're there is because their next door neighbor brought them in the door and brought them to my event and that they're on my board, then I'm sitting there thinking, okay, when I get to the ask, when I get to the ask, I'm bringing that board member with me. I am thinking about that, but for right now, in this conversation, I am laser focused on the donor. I want to know why they're there. I want to know what's most important to them about there. It's interesting because, as you'll see when we get to the questions in a minute, the objections. 
a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, now's not the right time. I'm getting ready to retire. Oh, that is another loaded question. I cannot wait for that, to hear that. I can ask so many things. Oh, tell me about that. Are you going to downsize? Are you moving? Where are your children? Are you going to move to their city? How many grandchildren do you have? I, I mean, it opens, what's going to happen to your business? Are you going to sell it? If your son here working in the business, that sort of thing. But do you see how those doors open? Right now, I'm just building a relationship. I'm building a relationship. I'm not soliciting. Other questions. If they're talking about their children, are your children as philanthropic as you are? Tell me about where they are and what they do and how you got them engaged in the community. Is there anybody, if we're going to talk about a gift, we should include in the conversation. And if I'm talking about an estate gift, if I've got a loyal donor and very involved, I'm going to look at them and say, you know what, you know our organization so well, if you look out for the next 10 years or so, what do you think our biggest challenge is? What have we got to be able to do right to serve this community? What, or either, what do you think we do so well that we've got to do more of it? Why am I asking that? I'm trying to take their vision for right now, the here and now, for the future, the both and. I want both and. There's a guy out of Texas Tech, a professor, Russell James. You may have heard of him and his work. Good friend of mine. Great research on estate gifts. Here's what he found. Donors who put an estate gift in place increased their annual giving by 75%. And he not only studied it in one year, he took it out eight years. And they sustained that higher level of giving. Why? They're more invested. They're deeply invested in your future and success. Good news, right? So these are important conversations, extending their vision to the future. What is our greatest challenge? Once they tell you that what I say is, what if we could work together to achieve that? What if I could show you a way to make that happen? You see how easy this is. You're just facilitating what they want to do. Now, here's the truth of the matter. I have this conversation with some donors, and we go through all of this very quickly in an hour, one meeting. Sometimes it takes two or three meetings. Remember what you're doing is building a relationship with a donor that's going to open doors for a bigger annual investment and deferred gift investment. This is time well spent. At a minimum, you are working on gift retention. At a minimum. So these are important conversations to have. We're not having it with everybody. We're having it with our AAAs. That's where we're starting. We're looking at our most committed donors, our most engaged donors, and we're getting to know them better. We want to know the story. Yes? I, I want to make a comment because you've been saying database. Please write down everything relationship you learned about them, not just next steps, so that you don't have to do it the second time you go into the You know my story about the hospital and my son? I've now told that story to three foundation directors. Three. You know what that tells me? They didn't write it down. Do y'all think that's as much a need to know as I do? I do. It's a need to know. They didn't write it down. You make a great point. So, everything you learn 
everything you learn. You learn they have three children, five grandchildren. You want to write that down because that's going to factor in the way they think about giving 5% of their assets to charity. You need to make that come alive for them. Does this make sense? I know big excitement about magic questions. That's all that is. It is just a simple, straightforward way to, I have to sit down with donors I've never met before. All the time when I'm with my clients. I've never met these people before. I start with these questions. I start with these questions. And by the time I get to the gift planning part of it, we've got trust going on. It's so amazing. Yes? Just to piggyback real quick on the fact of his, the database, when you're learning something, and your story, you told three different foundations. In an organization, if there's more than one person there who's making those calls, who's making these initials, who's reaching out to your triple A's, yes, your database, putting that information in there, the lady across the room there, you know, how is she going to approach them if they are, were brought in by another foundation right. person or something? But documentation is key, especially when you have more than one person because not one person can make all these calls, can make these reach outs or anything like that. Documentation in your database. I just wanted to take you back on that. Uh, yes, uh, that is a great thing to emphasize. Here's the thing. Staff will change. They will change. I don't want to see any shadow databases where somebody's keeping private notes because they're going to walk out of the door. I don't want to see head storage where you know them so well and you walk out of the door and all that knowledge walks out of the door. You've got to create the culture and discipline in your organization and you do that with call reports. You do that with a formal way to document what happened in that conversation. You make it as easy as possible, but it's got to go in the database. And you, as leaders in your organization, set that culture. I just cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, enough. It is critical information. Otherwise, you're spinning your wheel. You're spinning your wheel. And nobody gets time to do that. Now, if I'm on a call, I've already admitted we have not made the ask yet. Maybe, maybe I need to follow up. Maybe when I told the dean that I was all about faculty, if he were smart, he wasn't quite there. He would say, you know, Professor Harrison, who taught you contracts, is still there. You, he would love to see how you're doing. Would you like to meet him? Okay, that's my next step. Or if I'm talking to somebody about child abuse, I, said, I might say, you know what? This issue exploded during COVID and we're worried that inflation with the financial pressures, it will get even worse. I would love to bring you some more information or show you our facility or whatever it is. You see what I mean? I'm not ever leaving a meeting without opening the door to get permission for my next meeting. I ask permission. May I bring this back to you? May I get you to our office to show you this? May I get you more information? I'm gonna, you mentioned something and I need to follow up and give you more information. May I bring it back to you? I always am looking forward because I'm never finished with the donor. And, you know, they may have needs. They may need an attorney. Oh, I'd love to include you, but I don't know how. I don't have an estate planning attorney. Well, ding, ding, ding. Let me call and get you a few names. Call the Community Foundation. They can help you if you don't have the answer. They are a fabulous resource. Look what I said. After every visit, record the details. If you planted an idea, make sure you know that you planted an idea and calendar follow-up. One of the things that I would encourage you to say to every good donor, every long-term donor, is this. 
When I'm meeting with somebody and I'm going through my thank you, you have had, at the end of every call, I do this with a donor, if we haven't already talked about it. I say, you know, Amy, I want to thank you again. You are changing lives. I wish you could see the people I see every day that are benefiting from your gifts. I want to ask you to consider impacting lives for generations with a gift through your estate. There are some simple ways to do it. You don't even need a lawyer. You can name, there are simple ways to do it. If you would like more information, I would love to share it with you. What have I done? I've built on the Lilly research that said one in three, if asked, would consider it. So I want to put that ask out there. I am saying I want to ask you to impact lives for generations. It is compelling. You're not making a hard ask. It is a soft ask. And it will be amazing to you how that percolates and people decide to do that. So important that you ask that. You're not going in to say, you know you're going to die. <laughs> have you thought about what happens to your stuff? Can we have some? That is not the conversation. The conversation is all about them. You changed lives. I want to ask you to consider changing lives for generations to come. Everybody can do it. Everybody in this room can do it. There in the single thing we've talked about in these conversations beyond your capacity. It's not like you have to explain how charitable remaining trust works in the regs. It's not like you have to go tech on. I work with all kinds of charities, big ones, like a Mayo Clinic, with all those billions of dollars of revenue, and I work with food banks and gospel rescue ministries. It doesn't matter. All of those have, if I look at their revenue, quit the dressing. Um, if I look at their revenue for mature gifts, estate gifts, more than 90% are requests and beneficiary designations. 90%. Penn, Georgetown, Mayo, simple. And we can all talk about those. But remember that your power is in knowing your mission and being able to hear them about what's most important. Then if you need help with a big solicitation, call your colleague, brainstorm, call the foundation, call your board member. You can do it if you still have a little fear. I was so scared. The first time I went to solicit a big gift, I was at United Way. I was chair of the board. That was part of my job. I had to go make the big asks. And I was terrified. And I went on a call with the executive director and just watched. And I thought, I can do this because it wasn't what I thought. I think if you have anxiety about these calls, it's because you've really never had one of these comfortable younger conversations. But go with somebody that's good at it, and you'll learn. I went one time, and I figured it out. I could figure out my path. You need to do that if you're still a little anxious about that. So I want to talk a little bit about listening for opportunities. I love to get objections, as I said, because you'll hear things, you'll be able to ask questions. These are some of the things. My first priority is to take care of my mother. She's in her 80s, depends on me. She wanted to stay home, so I've got rounds of care for her. I can't do anything right now. One of our children has special needs. My wife and I provide resources for her. 
We want to focus on that. I can't do anything for you right now. I know I probably need a will and need to look at some kind of estate planning, but I don't know where to start. I mean, it's like everybody procrastinates. So these are the kind of, what are they doing? They're doing this. They're pushing you back. So let's talk about how to answer these questions and the opportunities. One, I just can't afford to do that right now. Gosh, this inflation, can you believe it? It cost me $5 a pound for chicken thighs. I can't even believe it. My grocery bill is double. I paid $80 to fill up my car the other day. I'm really worried about that. Here's the first thing I do. They've got a concern that I am going to hear them. I am going to acknowledge. I understand. There are a lot of demands on cash, especially with the uncertainty. The job markets, the COVID, all right? I've acknowledged their concern. I'm going to change gears. I'm going to go to my magic questions. Tell me, you know, you have been such a good donor. I'm not quite sure how long you've been giving. Tell me when you made your first gift and why. And I go down that path. Then, if they're telling me they don't have the cash, they're 70 and a half. I'm going to suggest some alternatives. Why don't you use your IRA? Have you ever thought of that? What if you do, they have a donor advice fund? You know, if you have a donor advice fund, and I know a lot of people do, you might use that. That won't be cash out of your pocket. Remember, they're not looking for a tax deduction, only 10% item up. Do you see what we're doing? If I've got the big arm in front of me, Catherine, I know why you're here. You want a gift, I can't afford, let me tell you why. Let me tell you all the reasons why I can't give you a gift. I'm gonna just change the conversation. I'm gonna say, tell me more about you. That is the beauty of that. And once I know more about why they're there, that's gonna reaffirm the importance to them of our organization, and then I can solve the problem. That I know things are tight right now, but if you really wanted to make an impact, your gift could not make more of an impact than right now for all the very reasons you've just mentioned. Why don't you use your IRA? Or why don't you think about this? I'm always going to recommend, you know, use appreciated stock. Everybody in stock. Everybody. And so use that. Use your IRA. It, it, tell them they can set up a donor advice fund at the foundation, that that's the most effective way. What, uh, what's the logistics of a donor advice fund? A donor advice fund is a fund that you create, so you make the gift to the foundation, they hold it, and then you can advise on where that money goes over a period of time. And the reason donors do it, donor advised funds exploded after they changed the charitable, the standard deduction, and the reason was only 10% itemized now, so people who want an itemized deduction, wanted to be able to give in 2022 an itemized, because maybe they had other itemized expenses, and then use that money for the next years where they're not gonna get to itemize. So it's just a timing thing, but donor advised funds, I don't know if you know the data I used to have. I have a slide, this is a different presentation, with the dollars going to donor advised funds for this incredible amount of money every year. Um, and it's just a timing for donors. They give appreciated assets, avoid the capital gains, and then have the right to tell the charity where it goes over several years. So a lot of the donors I work with, I mean, I'm surprised, high net worth and not so high net worth, 
have to other bonds funds, and I consider it a big pool of unused money. Is it funds that are immediately available? Yes, they're immediately available. If I gave um, a thousand shares of Coca-Cola stock to the foundation, to my donor advice fund, they're gonna sell it on receipt, and I've got cash in there, so all I do is call the foundation and say, distribute, I wanna send a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars to X organization. And it has to be given to charity. It has to go to public charities. They have to be a 501c3 organization, but they can direct it to any of those. Catherine? Yes. Could I add a point to that? Um, with the professional advisors that we spoke with yesterday, we highlighted the idea of um, using a donor advice fund in what we would call bundling concept. Catherine just um, explained giving more in one year than you would have otherwise so that you can get your charitable deduction up above the standard deduction and then using the money in that donor advice fund to fund your, your charitable giving gifts the over the next three years perhaps. And then in the fourth year, giving again more than you would have usually into the donor advice fund so that then you can, can taking those, that, that, that charitable deduction. Basically, the donor's getting a tax deduction in that year when they give the gift to create the donor advice fund, they're getting all the tax deduction for their next years of giving in that one year. Right. So that's the appeal. What if they say, I don't itemize, so I don't get a charitable deduction. I love that. I'll always acknowledge, you know, you are right. Only 10% of the people itemize. And it, it's a big change. Before all the rules, actually only 29% itemized. So only a third, and remember 65% give to charities. So you're my three ideas, you've heard them. If you're 70 and a half or older, use your IRA. Use long-term appreciated stocks and bonds, that's the most common, to make your gift, so you avoid the capital gains and get a tax benefit or use your donor advice fund. You, you provide solutions. How about, I'm worried I'll need more income in retirement. I'll say, good gracious, I worry about that too. With inflation and costs going up, I worry, did you realize there are gifts that will pay you income? There are? Yes, there are. Would you like to know more about that? That's when you go back home, pick up the phone, call the foundation, and get more information. But I also, if they're in retirement, that's that big open door. Are you gonna downsize your home? Are you moving? Are you gonna stay in Hutchinson? Or are you moving somewhere else? Oh, you're moving to be with your children. You know, I've never asked you about your children. Tell me about them. How many? Oh, what do they do? And how many grandchildren do you have? Oh, lucky you. I mean, it's just a normal conversation. Think of all the information I'm getting. What was one of the things I told you about the triple A's and the demographics? No children? Oh, no children. Ding, 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 ding. That makes more of a possibility. So, Here's my language. If they want income, a gift that pays income, it's so easy to say, I am not the expert, but I know someone who is. May I bring back some ideas for you. You're, there you are. You see how you can manage these objections. You acknowledge, you learn more about them, and why they're pushing back and go through those open doors and then you can follow up. I would love to do it and give, but I can't do anything significant. What would you like to do? If money were no object, what is it you would like to do? Or if I could show you a way to do that, 
Have you ever heard of a virtual endowment? Oh, let me explain how that works. <coughs> Have you ever heard of a blended gift? Oh, I'd love to tell you more about that. Your vision is what you're thinking about is going to change so many lives. You're listening, you're acknowledging, you're learning more about what they want to do, and you're not even saying what the answer is. You're saying, let me think about it. What if I could show you a way to make that happen? Would you be interested? It's their vision. It's their goal, not mine. So if I say, you know what? I know that seems way out of reach. But what if I could show you how to make that happen? Now, I know for those of you that are working on getting annual revenue in the door every day, these seem like crazy conversations. They are not. You are building, you are doing the hard part. There are two things that you're doing that you don't need to lose sight of. One, you are out there every day changing lives. That's what you do. You've got a record of success. That's the hard part. The second hard part is getting them to make that first gift. So if they are giving to you regularly, you've done that hard part. And you may think, I'm just going to send them twice as many direct mail solicitations. I don't want you to come to my house and see what happens to those. They don't go anywhere except into the trash. I'm not trying to be cruel. It's just reality. You're not connected to that direct mail. But if you get on the phone and just open the door of the conversation and tell them you've never met them and they, you want to hear their story because they make such an impact, that changes everything. I want you to practice it. Every last one of you can find at least five donors to practice on. Now I promised we would have that conversation. I'm not sure we're going to have time for that conversation. We will do it if we have time. But here's the thing. If we don't have time to practice it, I want every one of you to put on the top of your to-do list going back to your office or going to a family member and I want you to say this. Susan, what is the charity that you support that is most important to you? How did you get involved in that charity? Do you give to them or do you volunteer? Oh, you do both. How did that start? Did you start as a volunteer or as a donor? Why do you do that? What is it that they do that is most important to you? If you could do anything to improve the work of that charity, what would it be? What is their big need? What am I doing here? I'm just, you could have this conversation with your sister, your brother, your cousin, your mailman, your friend next door, that's the conversation I want you to have because it's going to show you how easy it is, how much information you learn. These are people you see every day, and you're going to learn something new about them. And it's going to make you smile, and it's going to make them smile to tell you about it. Just ask. Just get in the habit. If you had one conversation 
a day like this. Ask people in your office. Ask people in your office. <coughs> Ask people in your Sunday school class. Wherever they are, I think that you will quickly become better at this. Because it's simply a matter of putting them at ease and learning about it. And if you're not asking for your own organization, now how much easier is that? But you're asking initially your practice runs, your training wheels. There's no risk at all. You're asking them about them and what's most important to them in the community. So, try that. Try that, you're gonna be surprised. It will make you a lot more comfortable when you realize how people open up. And then, you can call those donors at your organization and focus on why they're there. You might hear transactional markers, I'm getting ready to retire, I'm getting ready to sell my business, when a donor tells me they're about to sell their business, I, I go, tell me about that. When did you start that business? Did you build it? Does your family work in it? Tell me a little bit more about what you do. I've never asked. When do you think you're going to sell it? Are you going to sell it to people already in the company? Are you going to put it on the market? What's going to happen after you sell it? Are you going to stay here? I hope you are. We need you. Do you see what I mean? Anytime I hear they're doing these things, I want to know a little bit more. I've had people tell me they were receiving inheritance. Oh, tell me about your parents. Did they grow up here? Oh, I know you miss them. Tell me a little bit more. And do you have siblings? I've never even asked you if you have brothers and sisters. So, you see what I mean? I'm all about the donor. I want to learn about it. How about now's not a good time? We've just really talked about this. I'm selling my business. Donors tend to compartmentalize. Well, I want to get them to make the gift before they sell the business. Why? I want them to avoid the capital gains. So, what I'm saying to them is you know, I'm not the expert, but there may be a way to save taxes on that transaction and make that gift we've been talking about. Would you be interested in thinking about that before this goes further? There's some real advantages to you, is what I'm saying. How about, I'm worried about taking care of my spouse and making sure they have sufficient resources. Well, of course they are. They're not going to give you money that would compromise that, but I love this question. Oh, tell me one more. How long have y'all been married? Really? Wow, that's amazing. And tell me what, where you are, what you're most worried about. Are you worried about income? Are you in, worried about resources? If you're not here anymore, do y'all have a planner? Have y'all sat down? That's really the best way to think out loud about this. And do you know that there are actually gifts that may pay income? Have you, would you like to know more? It, it, the beauty is you can combine your personal goals, taking care of your wife, your child, your son, with charitable goals and get a lot more lift, a lot more power. Would you be interested in thinking out loud about that? If I could show you a way to do that. You're focused on them until you know what they're worried about. You can't really go further. Oh, I don't mean shop. I was use this one for a hospital. I, I want to make sure I can take care of my family. I don't think I have enough to include you. This goes back to 5%. When they tell me I have, they have four children, we want to make sure we get everybody that they have enough. I love that. And I can suggest things like, you know, a lot of people like you who have had 
Such charitable priorities during your life treat their charities like a child. Or they simply do a 5% share of their estate for the charities that have been so important to them. And if you have four children, that really just reduces their share by 1.25%. And it's easy to accommodate. And I also, when I'm talking to donors, one of the questions I ask them, and it may seem very personal, but I get them to fill out a little worksheet about their priority. And it's usually lifestyle, spouse, and children, and charities third. And I will, just, I, you know, when we, it has three columns. The middle column is what they want to achieve. The left column is priority, one, two, three, four, five. Like when our sons were in school at Vanderbilt and at Berkeley College of Music, if something happened to us, my number one priority was that they finished school. I wanted to make sure they were fun. So that's how I'm on it. Once they were out of school, it vanishes from my list. You see what I mean? Now on the right hand side, the right hand column is to quantify the amount. So I've had this conversation. I got them to fill out the middle column before they come in. And I'll say, well, how much do you want your children to have? Because it's usually a finite amount. Nobody wants to give them everything and make them sorry. Bill Gates, their children, ten million each. I would love to be with Bill Gates. I could work with ten million. But the point is, here's a man that has thirty-six billion in his foundation and has put twice that amount in there. He's very wealthy, and he's got a specific amount he wants to leave to his children. So that's my point. Yes, question. So I've heard Aubrey has said this before, but then in a meeting where she said this, can you explain again in the room why we're talking about percentages now more in this in this era as opposed to dollars? Right, we're talking about percentages. I know a dollar now is more gratifying, but the truth is people don't know what they're going to have. And so a lot of times if I'm talking about priorities, I want to make sure each of my children gets 500,000. That I see quantified. But if you talk to them about charity, what you, if you're talking in percentages, then whether it's up or down, you get that share. And what my experience has been is it's always more than they thought. If they peg me, at a hundred thousand dollar gift, and then their estate continues to appreciate. I'm going to lose. I'll get my hundred thousand, but if I talk to them about a percentage, I might get more. I would say donors. It's a donor preference. I always let the donor decide how to define that. But I would say a quarter of the gifts I do are specific amounts. And the remainder are percentages, either of a retirement plan, an insurance policy, an estate, an estate after expenses, whatever it is. That it's more comfortable for them because then they know they're not going to be embarrassed if for some reason financial fortunes turn and they can't afford it. Final thoughts. The key to this is you. The key to this conversation is your donor and knowing the donor. It works for annual gifts. It works for big gifts. It works for deferred estate gifts. It is all about the donor. Realize there is one, here's our dream with the donor. We want them to come in the door, and we want them to stay. Once they're in there, we want them to give more. Once they're giving more, even if they're not, if they're just consistent, we want the both end. We want the today gift and the estate gift. Your job is to know that donor and keep them on that journey. When they come in the door, they're brand new. I'm not having these conversations 
with first time donors. Although I always advocate, if you've got a first time donor, that is somebody I'm going to pick up the phone and call and say, Catherine, you are a new donor. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate your gift and what an impact it is going to have. I just want to thank you. Think about that. I'm saying that I'm paying attention. I'm saying their gift is critically important. It came just at the right time. There's no downside to doing that. You need to get in the habit of uh, first time donors, make that quick call. Five year donors, 10 year donors, 15 year donors, make that call. Let them know you are paying attention and that they are important. It is really that simple. So, I will tell you, focus frenzy on your data. Frenzy, frenzy, frenzy. Keep good data. Go back and think about the five donors that you want to have this conversation with. If you're nervous, practice on friends. Do that anyway. And then make those calls. And what you're going to find is you realize you're good at this because you know something that they need to know, and that is the impact of your work, the need in the community, and where you're going with it. That's your strength. That's your strength. So I hope everybody has more courage now. And I want to hear stories about your success. You tell her, she'll tell me. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for what you did for this community. and serving your particular clients and 
learning about each other, learning how you can work even more efficiently and effectively if you do something together, or at least are aware of each other's services. And so um, when we say that you all are our partners, we're not, we're not just saying it, we mean it. And we thank you very much for all that work. Um, just a little bit about some of the information up here. You can see it's a wide variety of organizations, even a wide variety of communities represented up there as far as out in Reno County, not just Hutchinson. Um, since 1990, the Community Foundation has granted $4.6 million to organizations serving Reno County. Um, and that, um, those grants include the fund for Reno County, but it also includes our other grant cycles. It includes gifts that, as we talked a little bit about donor advised funds, it counts grants that people choose to make through their donor advised funds directly to organizations. So um, $4.6 million has been put out to the community to do the good work that you all are, are the, the masters of. And we really um, appreciate that. And we appreciate, the, we appreciate the opportunity of knowing what it is you need, what it is you're working on, and the great ideas you have. So even if you're not in the market for a, a grant right now, um, it, give us a holler. Just share. We'd love to get together and have a cup of coffee with you, have you come up to our office if that's more comfortable for you, and, and just learn more about what you're your goals are for your organization and possibly some of the challenges you see ahead. So, um, another um, cool fact is that in 2021, just in 2021, which is um, the grants that you can see up there, um, we granted out $401,725 to 33 different partners. So, I think that's a, a a great, a great testament to that there's 33 organizations and or communities that, that are thinking about how can we make life better in Reno County for people. So we're, we're, we're very excited to get to help with that. And before I move on, on to our next little featured activity, I want to say that I know that um, we, we ran out of time to, to have a practice conversation with um, folks that are sitting at the table with you. And I want to encourage you to take advantage of the fact that we have a, an account set up at Scuttlebutt's Coffee Shop that's in um, Claymore's Disability Support Building. And I want to encourage you to look around the room and see who you, who you know, who's here, who you want to get to know better that's here, and invite them to go for a cup of coffee and actually do your practice with each other and just See how it goes. It's not a, a asking for money and developing donors is not a competition among different agencies. As Catherine said, once you get to know your donors, you're going to know if they're if they're the people that you're going to want to pursue. And you may even hear something that allows you to tell your friend at a completely different type of organization that they should make sure they follow up with that person because. It's obvious they have an interest in your work. So um, take advantage of that. You just when you go up to pay, you, you just say, I want to put it on a nonprofits connect account, and you can pay for both of your coffees and enjoy your time together. So okay, one of the neat things we're gonna do today is we're gonna have um, a few of the partners in the room share a change maker story. Because one thing that you are besides besides partners is you are change makers. You're all out there changing the environment and the culture and the lives of people in this county. And um, there, we've got three organizations that are willing to uh, share a little bit about what how they've been change maker change makers in this most recent year. The first one who's going to share is Nicole Mance from. The Hutchinson Zoo. You are going to welcome her to the
Hi everybody, I'm Nicole Mans. I'm the director at the Hutchinson Zoo. And um, we have some slides to show you and a quick little five minute presentation, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so the Hutchinson Zoo, uh, our mission is to create an atmosphere for children and, children and families to engage and learn and conserve the natural world. Um, we are super thankful um, to all of you for being supported largely by the city of Hutchinson. Um, we are free to our guests, um, and our top value is really about families spending time together um, and being able to spend time in the natural world and to hopefully fall in love with our animals and help conserve them. Uh, I, can, I can move it down. Um, here's one of our uh, favorite rehab animals, and um, one of our next most important values is conservation. So, um, as a part of our facility, we are blessed that we have um, the ability to rehab Kansas uh, native wildlife. And so, we have an array of native wildlife. Um, we are a state and federally licensed rehabilitation facility. So caring for those animals and releasing them. We see over 700 animals a year just on those intakes and our release rate is about 70%. Um, so we're really grateful for that and grateful for the support that we see. Our staff and our volunteers, it's a very small staff. Um, our staff and volunteers work really hard every day for that. Um, so when I think about what our main bright spot has been, I've only been at the zoo about a year and a half, um, and when I started, our board was um, really small. I came to our first board meeting and there were three members that showed up. Um, and so what we have seen happen in the last year and a half is um, a re- um, I guess a reinvigoration, um, a re-engagement. We really just took a different avenue instead of just making it a business meeting and giving them a report about how we're doing and all of those key performance measures. Uh, we started taking them out in the zoo. We started having them uh, meet our staff. Um, they got to feed apples to our um, bison, Norman, who is the best bison in the world. Some of you may know him. Um, and uh, they got to meet our beaver uh, babies as well. And so um, seeing what we're doing, having them be a part of the story, I think really was the key to that piece. And so um, as a part of that, uh, we have been able to um, finish our campaign with the nature play area and as you guys know um, or may know we actually had to go over a little over budget um, and our board committed to that overage um, and and um, getting that money to be able to complete that project um, on time and it's part of our change maker grants thank you guys so much uh, the spider web will make an appearance once again at the and then our next um, project is our bison area. And so what's amazing about this um, is that one of our donors, longtime donors, um, who also is Norman's dad, um, <laughs> gave us the opportunity of a lead gift to be able to really work on this project. And even though we were not done with our nature play project, we presented this opportunity to our board and they wholeheartedly, unanimously agreed to raise the funds um, and start this campaign before we were done with the other campaign uh, to get it going so that we have a new bison viewing area. Right now, you guys may know that you see bison across the pond. They're in a two-acre habitat, um, but you only see them from a distance. But this allows us to get up front, um, get you guys up front and close to them. It also allows us to bring our animal care staff and the work they do with our bison into the forefront. And so you'll see us do training for them. Um, that's, I guess, what I have. <laughs> <laughs> Step to the
the script. <laughs>
visionary prevention and compassionate community recovery. The mission is to reduce and prevent substance misuse to improve Reno County's quality of life for all through access to resources for prevention, treatment, and recovery support. And all of those things can be summed up in the values of compassionate collaboration to reduce overdose death, holding true to the belief that no one deserves or has to die because they use or have used substances and that everyone can bring something of value to their community regardless of their past. And you can see those things, resources, quality of life, collaboration. Now, one of the recent bright spots has been the new portal. If you haven't heard about it, here it is. So, it's the Reno Recovery Portal with local resources, self-assessment tools, recovery housing that is local, our social detox, our medical detox, local support groups, mobile recovery apps, virtual meetings, not one provider over the other, not facilities all over the state, but Reno County. Local healing, local solutions, building what is called recovery capital in our county. And so why it's been successful, some of you might be familiar with Simon Sinek and his work. In the book, Leaders Eat Last, he talks about the circle of safety. So because through the years, long before I was involved, the work was started with what was called the Drug Impact Task Force. But since then, there's been humble changes where people's opinions and experiences have been considered and we've educated one another. We've created that circle of safety where ideas and thoughts and opinions are free to be expressed and discussed. When people feel safe, they're free to focus on growth and the interests of the organization and the community instead of self-preservation, right? You don't want to have to worry about self-preservation. That's what happens though. That's what happens when there's the danger that's outside of the circle of safety. So what's next? Well, of course, we want to continue that circle of safety within the collaboration, but we want to take it outside of it. We want to expand it. We want to continue to bring in more partners, more organizations with more projects that include all other partners with other sectors that might not have always seen how their work coincides with this one. See, we hope to naturally and in a progressive manner push the envelope to let the data and the work and these progressive <coughs> ideas and successes of the group as a whole guide us in this direction in the process continuing to affect the minds and the hearts of those in Reno County and in effect change the world. So our advice can be summed up in this. And Miss Lee, she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. But we want to expound on this because she's alluding to people passionate about a cause. So what we want to keep in mind is never stifle someone's passion, use it. But also don't let your own passion be stifled. But also, don't let our passion and our commitment drive us into a silo or into a box. See, every one of us here is a leader and has the ability to be one if we don't view ourselves as one. We wouldn't be here at a change maker summit if we weren't. But leaders are interested in growing things and most important of that should be growth in ourselves. See, people, coalitions, organizations, and communities become stagnant without change. And change is needed now more than ever in the world. So the question is, are we going to be a part of it?
Well, um, I, we should probably, just not need an introduction, but this is Perry Mayu, our Director of Strategic Initiatives. And um, she's going to close out the program, but I want to thank Seth for, for sharing his chat as well. I am just going to call it a mic drop, even though it's not racist, I don't know. <laughs> I think, perfect. Um, thank you so much to Seth, Erica, and Nicole. I'm, I'm so proud to work alongside you in the community. Um, I wish we could hear from every one of you in the room. I know you all have a story to tell about what's going well in your work and why that's working. There's something to teach the rest of us. Um, so we hope to keep bringing more uh, change maker chats and that spirit of of storytelling and, and sharing wisdom um, forward um, beyond today. Um, we have reached the end of our time together, but it's just the beginning of what's next. And whatever comes next is more connecting, more experimenting, and more dreaming. Uh, please remember before you leave to return to the reciprocity ring um, and see if your request has been fulfilled, or if you can still fulfill someone's request before you leave. Um, so if your request has been fulfilled, just take the blue slip, um, follow up with that person, um, and kind of close that, that ring loop um, of give and take. Remember, everyone gives and everyone takes in this process that leverages this group's networks and knowledge. Now, I want you to look at the succulent in front of you on the table, pull it toward you, I'm going to do a mindfulness exercise here. So imagine the roots and the dark soil, incrementally stretching but staying close to the surface. Consider the way its thick stems retain water, how it is adapted to thrive in challenging environments. Observe the artful pattern it makes its particular shades of green and waxy texture. Think about how its parts are connected, how it is built for resilience, and how it thrives with the right kind of care. That succulent is now yours to take back to your desk at work or a shelf at home. It's a reminder of what we have learned and experienced today. Um, do you remember to put it in another pot though? Because um, it's just in one of those bamboo containers, so you want it to stay alive, right? <laughs> um, that's not all you can take away today. Hopefully, of course, you're taking away lots of lessons learned um, through Catherine's um, workshop. Um, but each succulent also has a little card in it. Let's pull out that card and turn it over on the back. Um, raise your card in the air. It has. If you have the letter C on the back of your card, you have won the gift of connection. So you get a $10 gift card to match with and coffee. So you can invite your friends to go to the college and coffee. So keep your hand up, Wendy is going to come bring you your gift card. <laughs> so, and shout out to Metro for providing the coffee this morning. Um, we will continue to support them um, through your, your connections going forward. Um, five of you have an L on the back of your card. Raise your hand if you have an L. Okay. Um, if you have won the gift of legacy. So you have won a $150 giving card in honor of Hutchinson and Maynard County's success was in Thank you for donating to the charitable organization of your choice. So you can do, give it back to your organization, $150. Um, or you can make that choice yourself, but it's redeemable. Um, at, it's, it equals a charitable donation. So, congratulations. <laughs> registered before Tuesday to submit a brief proposal for the gift to dream, a $2,500 grant from the Fund for Reno County. 
What does your organization need to be able to dream, we asked. And 22 of you answered that question. So it was, fun, it was tough to find a short notice, short term grant committee with no conflicts of interest with any of the proposals in the room today, but we did. So thank you to Michelle Inski, Kelly McGill, and Ron Fisher for accepting the challenge to choose just one of those 22 proposals to award. And I'm excited to announce that the gift. Oh my God. <laughs> just. Get out there and do the work. Thank you all.